than a wicked and hip hop. Bad, bad, and a wicked and So today's class is about sorting and aggregation, and as usual, we're going to start with a few administrative things. So um, uh, first thing is homework number two is going to be due this uh, coming Sunday, October 3rd, as usual at 11.59 p.m. Uh, and remember, there are no uh, uh, late days. You can't use any of your extension days for uh, homeworks. They're just for the projects. Uh, and project number two is uh, out now and it's going to be due Sunday, October 17th. Um, there will be a Q&A session tomorrow, Thursday, September 30th from uh, 5 to 6 p.m. And if, if you uh, check the Piazza post, it'll have the Zoom link and all that uh, information in there. So uh, one final thing I just want to put on your radar, the midterm exam is going to be uh, Wednesday, October 13th. That's in class during the normal class time. Uh, and we'll release more details about the, the format uh, and everything at, by the beginning of next week. So uh, the topics that are going to be covered are just, uh, uh, you know, everything that we've covered um, so far up, up to the midpoint, uh, up to the midterm uh, in the class. So everything is fair game up until the, the midterm. Okay, so uh, last class we were kind of talking about index concurrency control and uh, we, we ran out of time at the end so I just want to pick up where we left off and finish off uh, the last little bit from that lecture and then we'll move on to the main topic today which is, as I said, sorting and aggregation. So I uh, kind of recall the, the piece we were talking about specifically was B plus tree concurrency control where we want to allow multiple threads to read and update uh, a B plus tree at the same time. So this lets us, we don't, we don't have, you know, a bunch of threads sitting around doing nothing. If we have a lot of cores in our system, uh, we can utilize all of that parallelism to concurrently operate on the B plus tree at the same time. But we need to uh, be careful to protect against these two types of problems that can come up. So again, one is that, you know, we have two concurrent threads modifying the contents of a single node, for example, like a leaf node at the same time. Uh, and another is that one thread uh, might be traversing the, the B plus tree structure while another is, you know, doing some reorganization operations that could be splitting, splitting nodes, merging nodes, rebalance kind of stuff. So we ended last time with this observation that uh, the, the first step in our latching algorithm to protect um, the, the contents of the B plus tree was that we were always going to take this right latch on uh, the root node of the tree every single time. So no matter what uh, right we wanted to do, we always had to first latch the, the root node. But as you, as you scale up to more threads, this um, can become kind of a performance bottleneck because remember the, the uh, right latch is exclusive. So no other threads can acquire a latch while um, the, the root node is, is right latched. So kind of the whole tree is is locked up and everyone's blocked, uh, at, at least until the, the modifying thread is able to release this root, root node latch. So uh, kind of a, a better latching algorithm uh, takes into account the following assumptions. So most modifications to a B plus tree will not require a, a split or a merge. Uh, so instead of assuming that there's going to be a split or a merge, we want to sort of optimistically traverse the tree using read latches. So remember, read latches are going to let other threads who also want to acquire uh, read latches come in and get those latches. So um, we could have multiple concurrent threads with read latches, but only one single thread with, with a right latch at, at any given time on a node. So uh, kind of the, the intuition is that, especially for the higher levels of the tree, there will be very few rebalancing operations. Now, in a lot of the examples we've showed, um, you know, the nodes are relatively small. They have two or three elements each. So obviously for, you know, illustration purposes, that's good because it can let us show rebalancing. But as you scale up to, you know, larger trees, imagine, I don't know, a million or a billion elements, um, most of the, the modifications are going to be taking place at the, the bottom layers of the tree. So the leaf nodes or, you know, the inner nodes that are only a few, few layers up from the leaf nodes. So kind of the, that's the intuition here that we can kind of optimistically traverse the tree, just getting the reed latches to protect kind of our, our path, our traversal through the tree, um, but not, 
not uh, intending to, to right latch things. And then, of course, uh, if we if we kind of guess wrong and we actually do need to uh, propagate these these rebalance operations up the tree, then you just you know, abort your operation and start over at the beginning acquiring. Now you know you need to acquire right latches, so you can kind of just repeat repeat the traversal. So, kind of, how does this work um, compared to the original algorithm we talked about? Uh, so, you know, search is the same as before. There's no difference there. Um, insert and delete, uh, as I said, we're going to set the latches the same as for, for search to get to the leaf until we get down to the leaf node, and then we're going to set the, the right latch. So all the latches are reads all the way down to the leaf, and then we set a, a right latch on the leaf node. So if the leaf is not safe, remember uh, we, we defined safe last time as it's, it doesn't need to split or merge, so there's enough room uh, or keys to accommodate whatever change you're going to make. So uh, when you get down to the leaf node, um, you, you ask, is this safe? If it is, then you're done, that's great. Uh, you have the right latch on it. If it's not safe, then you kind of have to, to start over from the root and traverse down getting, getting right latches. So that's why we call this optimistic. We optimistically assume that uh, we have, we're not going to, to need the right latches all the way down the tree. Um, versus pessimistically acquiring those, those latches as we descend the tree. So uh, we'll just look at two, two examples here quickly. So this is example two from um, the, the previous examples uh, where, we, where we did this kind of delete. We want to delete uh, key 38. So again, here, instead of taking the um, right latch on the root node, we're going to take this read latch uh, and just you know, descend, descend the tree as usual. Uh, taking, taking read latches all the way until we get to the bottom here. We acquire this right latch and we say, okay, we're, we, we want to delete this, this uh, key 38 here. H doesn't need to coalesce, so we're safe. We're done. Uh, we achieved the same thing that we did taking these right latches down the tree, um, just using the read latches. So we can you know, do our deletion and then we're, we're all set there. So uh, this is, a, is a example four, also from the, the previous examples, um, where this time we're going to insert uh, key 25. So again, we'll, we'll use the new read latching algorithm to uh, descend the tree until we get to where uh, the, the key 25 needs to insert. And we see, OK, here we need to split F. So we have to restart and re-execute the transaction for, or the, the insertion from uh, the, the root node, this time acquiring right latches because we figured out, okay, we have to split this node. Uh, we're going to need to, to um, uh, rebalance on some of the, the upper levels. So uh, d does anyone have any questions about either of these two examples? Okay, so I... Uh, this other thing that, that we can point out is that in all of the examples we showed so far, both in the last class with the pessimistic right latching and in this um, example here with the optimistic read latching is that uh, all of the threads have been acquiring the latches in this top-down fashion. So remember in the, uh, the hash table examples, we always have the threads uh, accessing the hash table in a, in a forward scan, you know, the, the linear probing uh, hash table you just scan forward in, in the table uh, until you wrap around and go back to the top. So they're always scanning in the same direction. They're always acquiring latches in the same direction. And um, in this case also for the B plus tree, we've always been acquiring latches starting from the root node and then as we, we traverse down the tree. So that, that kind of has um, allowed our, uh, us algorithmically to prevent deadlocks uh, because recall there's no sort of deadlock detection or deadlock prevention, the only thing we can do is avoid deadlocks through um, this kind of careful algorithm design. So one of the other operations we talked about on the B plus tree was this idea of a, uh, a leaf node scan. So you traverse down to the leaf node uh, where you want to start your scan, and then uh, we have these pointers, um, the sibling pointers where you can traverse across the leaf node layer to get a, a range of values uh, that you're looking for. So now what we have to think about is, okay, if we have uh, uh, threads potentially acquiring latches from the top of the tree, 
coming down and also threads potentially uh, scanning along the leaf node layer, we have to be careful that we don't run into a situation where we have a deadlock. So we'll see a few uh, just simple examples of this uh, come up. So uh, let's just do a simple leaf node scan here with one thread. So T1 wants to find all keys that are less than four. So um, what we're gonna do is just start here at the root, figure out which uh, leaf node we need to get to to find uh, the, the keys less than four. And then we want to scan now across uh, the leaf nodes to, to find our range. And similar to uh, how we were taking latches on uh, going down the tree in, in kind of this uh, log uh, lock latch coupling or uh, latch crabbing um, algorithm where you don't release uh, the latch on the, the node you currently hold until you have the latch on the, the one that you uh, want to go to next. We're gonna do the same thing uh, kind of in this, this leaf node scan. So here we don't wanna release the latch on the C leaf node before uh, T1 gets the latch on the B leaf node. So that's great, we got the latch and now we can move over here and release the latch on C because we're kind of doing in this um, coupling way where we always have you know, the, the current uh, latch and the next latch that we wanna get. So let's get a little more complicated here. Uh, we can now add in these two um, uh, uh, threads that are executing at the same time. So again, thread one still wants to find uh, all of the keys less than four, and thread two wants to find all of the keys greater than one. So you know, let's say they start at roughly around the same time. Uh, they can both get the, the uh, uh, read latch on the root node, that's fine. Uh, there's no problem there. And then they're going to, to move down to each of their uh, respective uh, leaf nodes where they need to, to start scanning. So now you have thread one that wants to scan backwards from four and thread two that wants to scan forwards from one. So you're gonna run into this situation here. Uh, they can you know, release their latches on the root node because they have their uh, leaf node that they're on now. And now they want to come over and acquire uh, a, a latch on uh, the other's leaf node. So what do we think is gonna happen here? Yes? So, isn't there a read-write block, or is it just a regular? So the question is, is it a, is it a read-write latch or just a regular mutation? Uh, let's assume it's a read-write latch just like all the other ones that we had, so you can either get it in, in read mode or write mode. Okay, so yes, that's correct. Uh, there's not gonna be a problem. Uh, both T1 and T2 can get um, the read latch on each other's uh, leaf nodes because, you know, as we saw before and we've discussed before, uh, there's no problem in this compatibility matrix if two threads want to both acquire a read latch at the same time. So kind of they're both going to get the read latch on each other's leaf nodes uh, and then, you know, they can release the latch that they hold once they uh, switch in that way. So uh, this example works out, but um, if we have now uh, arbitrary readers and writers at the same time, you can pretty easily run into uh, these kind of deadlocks as you're uh, acquiring latches in, in now not just a top-down fashion, uh, they can be you know, in, an, in an arbitrary fashion. So again, the important thing to remember uh, is that latches don't support deadlock detection or avoidance. Uh, the only thing we can do is through like, carefully designing the algorithms and the data structures to prevent these sorts of things from happening. So in the, the previous example here, um, you know, we could ensure or mandate that, uh, for example, uh, you can't scan uh, in the reverse direction across leaf nodes. We're only going to allow scans in the, the forward directions. So that would kind of be one way of preventing um, uh, deadlocks here. So kind of the, the key takeaway that, that we need to remember is that there's, there's no kind of higher level uh, deadlock detection or management. It's just uh, in, in the algorithm and data structure design, we have to be careful to avoid uh, deadlocks in, in our, um, our data structure traversals. So uh, just to wrap up with the uh, index and currency stuff, um, Generally, making data structures thread safe is, is notoriously difficult in practice. It's really hard to do. Uh, you really have to pay attention to figuring out if there are cases where you can run into 
potential um, concurrency errors or deadlocks or that kind of stuff and, and engineer around them. Uh, and again, we mostly focused on hash tables and B plus trees, but the same high level techniques um, can be applicable to other data structures. And we're not going to really talk about any more in this course, but uh, you could imagine you know, generalizing these same sorts of ideas to arbitrary uh, tree structures, for example. So uh, before we move on to uh, the, the main topic for today, are there any questions about uh, the, the concurrent index stuff? Okay. So uh, let's just take a step back and look at kind of the core status. So we've, we've talked about a lot of different layers of this uh, stack here representing the different uh, components of the DBMS. And today we're going to be talking about or at least start talking about how to uh, execute queries using the, the DBMS components that we've uh, discussed so far. So we're uh, at this operator execution layer in the stack right now. We've already talked about the disk manager. We've already talked about the buffer pool. We've already talked about you know, different access methods and index structures uh, that can speed up uh, accessing the, the, the data in the database. So now we're going to really be focusing on um, the, the different individual operators that we want to uh, provide to uh, the, the query interface. And over the course of the next four lectures, we're going to be talking about these uh, three topics. So specific operator algorithms, how we're going to implement individual operators, uh, different query processing models. So how do we you know, string these operators together to execute a, a, a query or like a SQL query, and then different runtime architectures that have trade-offs for uh, different you know, workloads or situations. So uh, just at a, at a high level, um, the, the thing that we're going to be executing is called a query plan. So in a query plan, uh, the operators are going to be arranged in a tree structure. Uh, it, technically, it's a, a directed acyclic graph. But just for our purposes, um, you can think of, about it as like a tree structure. So here we have this uh, really simple SQL query. Uh, it's just you know, selecting some values from two tables. You're doing a join between the two tables. And we're applying a filter condition on this B value. Uh, so the, the kind of way to think about this, and we'll talk more about this in uh, later lectures, uh, as, as we talk about the, the query processing models, but the, the way to kind of think about this at a high level is that data is going to flow from the leaves of this uh, query plan tree. So in each case, we have A and B at the bottom. That's just a scan of the tables A and B. So data is going to flow from the leaves of this query plan tree up to operators uh, in the inner nodes and then all the way up to the root of the tree. And whatever the root of the tree is, is going to be the output of the query plan. So kind of here we have this scan over A, a scan over B. The output from the scan over B is going to go to this uh, selection operator that's going to filter out some values based on the selection condition. Then those two inputs are going to go to the join. We're going to join them together and then finally do a projection uh, to just return the, the two attributes that we want. So this is how it, it, it's going to uh, work at a high level. And as I said, we'll, we'll kind of go into the details of how exactly this is implemented in um, a couple classes. So uh, the important thing to remember here is that just like we can't assume that a table is going to fit entirely in memory, uh, we also can't assume that the, the query results or even the intermediate results of these different operators we saw in the query plan on the last slide, we can't assume that they're going to fit entirely in memory. So the, the point of the disk-oriented DBMS that we've been talking about building is that it kind of gives uh, the, the user or the application the impression that you know, all of the data can be processed in memory even though the, the, the data might exceed memory. So uh, we're going to rely again on our, on our buffer pool that we've talked about uh, and, and you've implemented in a project. We're going to rely on that buffer pool mechanism uh, to implement the different algorithms that we need in order to build the disk. Uh, and again, it's important to remember that um, we're going to prefer uh, algorithms that maximize the amount of sequential I.O. So this is important uh, because of how, how disk accesses work. Sequential I.O., remember, is more, uh, 
more efficient than random I.O. And uh, just at a high level, uh, I mean, you may have uh, taken an algorithms course, learned about things like sorting, that kind of stuff. Uh, but what we're going to talk about here is different than how you may have studied algorithms in the past. Because, uh, you know, where we talk about the time complexity of an operation, like a hash table has O1 time complexity or something, or a, uh, you know, a search or sort has a N log N time complexity. Um, but I mentioned uh, uh, in, in one of the previous lectures that the important thing to care about is the constant that goes along with that uh, time complexity. Because again, if you have a, an O1 lookup in a hash table that goes to memory, that's okay. Uh, it's cheap to access memory relative to an O1 access in a hash table that goes to disk. If every single hash table access is to disk, it's going to be really slow, even though you know the, the theoretical time complexity is O1. So there's another good example of, of why the, the DBMS um, needs to think carefully about uh, managing its own memory and file I.O. We don't want the OS to do that or something, and, and why we have to kind of design these algorithms uh, to take into consideration the, the different disk accesses. Because uh, we can have you know, better you know, caching and prefetching policies than uh, just a, a, an OS I might have, because it's, it, it doesn't know exactly what types of operations we're trying to perform. So uh, the, the two things that we're going to talk about today uh, are the external merge sort, which is uh, basically just a sorting algorithm for out of memory uh, sort, so larger than memory sort. Um, and uh, different ag aggregation operations. So we're going to see kind of how these like high-level strategies um, ca can be uh, designed around like a divide and conquer uh, algorithm. We'll see how we can apply it to to different types of operators. Uh, so this is also going to segue into the next uh, class where we'll talk about an alternative to sorting, uh, which is uh, hash-based methods. So uh, what are some different reasons why we need to sort? Well, in previous lectures, uh, I have and continue to make a big deal out of this idea that the relational model or SQL uh, is a set or multi-set algebra. Um, so it's unsorted. So there's no inherent relationship or order between uh, different tuples in our, in our tables. So, why do we care about sorting? What are some examples of when we might need to sort our, our data? None? Okay, well, uh, the first and, and kind of most obvious one is that queries may request explicitly that the, the tuples that we return in our uh, results set or answer are sorted in a specific way. So if the SQL query specifies uh, kind of an order by clause, they say, okay, I want the output result that you're getting sorted by a, a particular attribute or set of attributes, then uh, the DBMS is going to need to take care of that. We're going to need to sort it in that particular order. So that's one example of when we might care about sorting uh, the data. Another situation is that, you know, even if the query doesn't explicitly specify some order, so even if the user doesn't care what order they get the results back in, uh, there are times when we may still want to perform sorting of the data in the database in order to uh, speed up or perform different algorithms. So uh, these are just a few examples I've given here. There are many others where you can apply the same idea. But for example, uh, if you want to do some sort of duplicate elimination, so you just want all of the distinct values in a particular table, uh, it's trivial to support this. Uh, duplicate elimination if you have the data sorted. So, you know, sort the data in a particular order. As you're scanning through, you can see consecutive values uh, can be removed from the, the output answer because, you know, you just saw uh, th that value previously. So you can kind of skip through the um, results in that way. Again, we talked about bulk loading sorted tuples into a B plus tree. Uh, it's much faster to do that uh, um, than to do insertions from the root node and follow the usual insertion algorithm. Uh, so you kind of do this bulk loading, but it requires that the data is sorted. So if you want to build a B plus tree in this uh, bulk load fashion, then you have to first sort your, your tuples and then build it from the leaf nodes up. Uh, and finally, uh, we'll see in this, this lecture an example of how you can uh, use 
sorted data to speed up aggregations and implement a, a group by. So you want to get an aggregate grouped by some value. Uh, the first step in that pipeline can be to sort the data and then perform the aggregation. And we'll see how that works in, in a couple slides. So again, uh, I, I mentioned this a few slides ago, but I just want to reiterate that if the data fits in memory, then you can just use any standard sorting algorithm. Quick sort, you know, any of the other million sorting algorithms that there are, pick your favorite one. Uh, you can use it, it doesn't matter, uh, because everything's in memory, everything's going to be fast. But the problem again is that if the data does not fit in memory, then we're going to need to use some kind of algorithm that knows about the fact that we're going to be writing to and reading from disk. So we have to know, okay, in advance, here's how much working room I have in memory, uh, and I'm going to be able to read in this many pages into my buffer pool, and then I have to kind of write them out um, in an intelligent way when my buffer pool fills up. So that's kind of the whole uh, idea behind this uh, external merge sort algorithm that we're going to talk about today. So as I mentioned, uh, external merge sort is basically a, a divide and conquer algorithm where you're going to split up your data into these uh, uh, separate pieces called runs and then you're going to sort each of those runs individually and then the last step uh, and this is the the merge phase is to combine them back into longer sorted runs so you know the the, the, the two basic phases we have are sorting where we sort individual chunks of data that are going to fit in memory so we read the data in, work on it in memory, sort it, and then we're gonna write out the sorted chunks uh, to a file on disk. And then phase two, the merging phase, we're going to combine sorted runs into, into larger uh, sorted chunks. So uh, the, the term run or sorted run uh, is basically just the list of key value pairs. So Again, the key is the attribute or attributes that, that we're going to use for the sort order, whatever we're sorting by. It could be um, you know, a primary key, it could be like a date. I want all the data ordered by uh, date or something. So it's whatever we're using to impose the sort order on uh, the tuples. The second piece is the value. So here you have, uh, as in many cases, two choices. You can either uh, you include the entire tuple in the sorted run, and this is called early materialization, or you can include just the record ID in the sorted run, and that's called late materialization. So the first example here, early materialization, basically um, if we're sorted by key, so the keys are ascending, key one, key two, et cetera, we're co-locating the tuple data directly in the sorted run with the keys. So this is early materialization because we're doing this uh, uh, proactively, we're putting all the data right with the keys where they need to be. The alternative, of course, is this late materialization idea where instead of uh, storing all of the tuple data, we're just going to store the key along with the pointer that's just a record ID that's going to tell us where to go at the end to, to reconstruct the tuple. And we'll talk about uh, the different reasons why we may prefer one over the other. Uh, it may have to do with the data storage model you have. So we talked a little bit about whether you have uh, a row store or a column store. Uh, that's one reason why you might prefer one over the other. There are also cases where, for example, if you're doing uh, a lot of filtering or something, it may be, or filtering at later stages, it may be beneficial to use this late materialization so you don't have to do a lot of extra copying. So we'll see some examples later um, where one of these methods might be preferred over the other. But for now, we're just going to, to uh, assume, you know, the, 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 we're not going to factor this uh, uh, trade-off into the, the algorithms that we're talking about. So uh, let's start with the, the simplest, most basic example, which is the two-way external merge sort, and then later we'll gener generalize it to a, a k-way sort. Um, so two is basically meaning the number of runs that we're going to merge into a new run for each pass. So at any given uh, uh, pass in the algorithm, we're only ever going to be taking, in this example, uh, two runs and then merging them into a single larger, longer run. So we're going to break the data up into n pages. Uh, imagine a table broken up into n pages. And uh, the DBMS is going to have a finite number of buffer pools, uh, buffer pool pages B that we're going to use to hold the input and the output. 
So um, you know, this is something we need to know ahead of time uh, in the DBMS, the amount of memory we have to work with to do our sorting. And it's, it's typically configurable. Uh, there are configuration options in Postgres, MySQL, whatever, uh, to figure out, you know, you can, as the database administrator, say, Here, here's how much uh, memory you should have available to, to do these types of operations. So we'll kind of go through an example here. Um, imagine we have a, a data set with two, just uh, for now, just two uh, pages stored on disk. And we want to do this two-way external merge sort. So the, the first pass, we'll call it pass number zero, is going to be to read all B pages of the table into memory. And we're going to sort the pages into runs and then write them each back out to disk. So uh, for now, let's just assume we have one, one page in our buffer pool and we're going to read them in one at a time and do this, this sorting. So let's first read in page number two. It's going to go into our buffer pool in memory. We're going to uh, do this nice sort. We can do it in place uh, even, so we don't. We just need that one um, free slot in the buffer pool. Now we have this sorted run, and then we're, we're going to write it back out to disk in this new uh, page here. So we have the original one unchanged. It's still unsorted, however it was previously. Now we have this new intermediate result uh, that we've materialized somewhere on disk that's the, the sorted version of page number two. So now the next step uh, is we have to read in page number one. Again, do our sort. So we get the sorted version of page um, uh, number one, the sorted run, and then we write that out to disk. So now the next step in the subsequent passes that we're in to recursively merge pairs of runs into runs that are each twice as long. So we're going to take each of these individual pages uh, and merge them into now pages that are, uh, or runs that are two pages long. So in order to do this, this step, uh, what's the minimum number of buffer pool pages that we're going to need here? Yes. So the answer is three, that is correct. And it is because we are going to need one for each of the input pages and then one for the output. So we have the two pages that are coming in in our two-way uh, external merge sort. And then we need one page left over to write the, the merged uh, page out. And then we're going to write that to disk. So the way this is going to work, again, is we're going to read in these two pages here. We're going to have our result page. We're going to write that out first. Uh, so once that page fills up from the, the uh, first two pages, because uh, you know, we have two pages, uh, we're only going to be able to fit some portion from each of those pages into this uh, output page. So we're going to write that part of the run out. So that's the first page of the run. And then we're going to reuse that same buffer pool slot. We're going to fill it up with the remainder from the two pages uh, in the second page of the run. So kind of the, the, the whole way this uh, uh, works is if we had more pages, you know, we just keep kind of repeating the process recursively until we get uh, one single run at the end. So uh, kind of what we can see maybe a more concrete example here uh, of how that works. Um, in each pass, we're going to be reading and writing every page in the file. So in terms of the total number of passes and the total I.O. cost, well, the total number of passes we need are uh, log two or the ceiling log two n plus one, and the plus one is that first initial um, pass number zero that we did, where we sort each each page individually. So I, I think uh, it, it might vary uh, in Wikipedia or in different textbooks if you see whether or not they include that first uh, sort pass, but uh, we'll we'll include it here. So it's the first sort sort pass plus. Um, the log, because again, we're doing, we're splitting it into um, recursively into these these uh, mer uh, merging two pages together at a time. Uh, so we have the ceiling log two n, and then the total I/O cost, because on on each pass we need to read and write every page of the file. We're going to end up with two n times the number of passes uh, in terms of I/O. So uh, just as a concrete example of how this works. Um, let's say we have these uh, pages here that we want to sort. So each page contains two values. Uh, and the, the last thing is just we'll say like a, an end of file character to let us know that we're done there. Um, so again, what we're going to do on pass number zero is we're going to read each of these pages in and sort them individually. So uh, we can get, get all of our values sorted um, 
for, for the next merging phase. So in this case, you know, some of the pages are already sorted, like the, three, th the first page, three, four, it's already in sorted order, so we don't really need to do anything. The second page goes from six, two, it gets flipped to two, six, uh, et cetera, all the way across. So now the next stage is to get to this pass number one, where we're going to merge each of the one page runs into two page runs. So we can just you know, take uh, uh, consecutive pairs here and merge them together. So the first one, we're gonna merge these two together and the way we're gonna do that is we're gonna look at the uh, minimum or lowest value in each of these uh, pages. So in this case, we're gonna see you know, the, the smallest value from the right page is going to be two. So that's gonna go in our first slot. Then we move the pointer over and we say, okay, now I have three and six. So three is smaller, so three is gonna go into the, the, uh, the um, run page that we're gonna write out. So now we can you know, kind of repeat the process uh, and fill out all of these pages in the same way, writing out a page as soon as we fill it up. So in this first, this, the case of the first two pages, when we merge them together, we filled up the page with two and three. Uh, we write that out and now we clear it and we have uh, four and six come in to fill out the second page of the two page runs. So this process continues all the way down, we get to pass number two, and now we merge them into uh, four page runs, and finally we merge it into one uh, final eight page run at the end, and that's the entire uh, thing sorted. So uh, this is kind of like a, a divide and conquer strategy where we split up the file into these uh, smaller runs, and then we uh, recursively merge them together to get a, a final sorted result. So are there any questions kind of at, at a high level about this, uh, how this algorithm works? Sure. This here? Uh, uh, yes, that should be N, sorry. I think that B, B was for the size of the buffer pool, right? And, and this is, um, we're talking about the, the number of pages in the table is N, yes, sorry. Sure. Are there any other questions about this? Or errors that I've made in the slides? Those are also welcome. Yes. So, uh, when you're doing like the last pass or like each merge, are, are they doing like sequentially or is there multiple threads that you can merge? Uh, so, the, the question is um, are, these, are these merge phases being performed sequentially or do you have multiple threads running concurrently uh, working on it? Um, the answer is, so for, for simplicity, for everything we're going to dis discuss here, uh, let's just assume one thread for now. So as soon as you know, we finish the first two, we're going to move on to the next two. However, uh, you could, and in fact, I, a lot of systems do, uh, partition up the, the work into multiple threads. So of course, you know, if you have, let's say you're working on um, the, the two-page runs, you want to merge the one-page runs into two-page runs, you could have each thread, you know, take two individual pages to, to do the merging, right? And th those can work independent of each other. And then as you get, you know, further and further down, you have to be careful about, you know, you can't, you can't use as many threads as you get further down in this, uh, in the number of passes. Um, so uh, for now, we're just gonna assume one thread doing all this. You could split it up. Um, but then again, also, if you have multiple concurrent threads running, you also have to think about um, the resource utilization. So for example, we've, we've said, okay, we're gonna have just for now two uh, buffer pool pages assigned, one for um, each of the inputs and then one for the output. Now if you have, in this case, let's say four-way parallelism, you now have four times the number of buffer pool pages assigned. So you need to think about uh, trading off the, the parallelism versus the amount of you know, extra resources you need to support that level of parallelism. So um, again, to, to reiterate the two-way uh, external merge sort, 
uh, is only going to require three buffer pool pages in order to perform the sorting. So B equals three. Uh, so again, two input pages and one output page. Um, but you know, I, th three pages is pretty restrictive. Uh, th that seems relatively small. If we have four kilobyte pages, it's not very big uh, in terms of today's uh, main memory. So uh, you know, in a lot of cases, you have B is greater than three. You have more uh, buffer pool space to work with. So what we need to do um, is figure out how to leverage that buffer space without having the, the worker thread that's doing the sorting have to block on disk I.O. Because kind of we're, we're reading in these pages uh, and then we're writing them out. We need to figure out how to do it in a way such that we're not um, blocking on disk I.O. Uh, waiting around for, for the uh, pages to get read right into the, the more buffer pool resources that we have. So the way we're going to do this is what's called double buffering. This is an optimization of the previous algorithm where basically we're just going to prefetch the next run in the background somehow. Either um, you know, there's some other thread that's doing the prefetching or you could issue uh, from the, the worker thread uh, a, a prefetch request for the next run that you know you're going to need. And basically we're just going to fetch that next run and we're going to store it in a, uh, an extra uh, buffer, buffer pool slot. So here we're reading in page uh, one from disk into our, our buffer pool in memory. And now let's say again it's doing its work, it's sorting, uh, doing what it needs to do there. And while that's happening in the background what we can be doing is also fetching this page number two which we also know we need to sort uh, into the buffer pool to kind of mask that, that disk I.O. so we can get it loaded and ready to work on as soon as uh, we're done working on the first um, page there. So now that that, that page is done, uh, we can move on to this next one and start sorting it right away. It's already in memory. We don't have to wait for uh, a, a separate disk I.O. request to get that page in. So kind of you can, you can uh, generalize this as far in advance as, as you want. If you have you know, a, a sufficiently large buffer pool, you can prefetch as many runs ahead as you want since you know the order that you need to uh, work on them in. So you can kind of mask it an arbitrarily uh, complex uh, disk. Or arbitrarily expensive disk uh, access. So are there any questions about this optimization here? Yes. So the question is, do you throw away the intermediate pages uh, that you write on disk, so the sorted, sorted runs that you write on disk as soon as you're done with them, or do you keep them around? Um, so technically, you don't need them anymore. Uh, as soon as you've done what you need to do with them, you can throw them away. As soon as the query result is returned, you can get rid of them. Uh, but uh, sometimes there may be reasons to keep them around. Uh, maybe it's a query that gets executed frequently, so you can kind of keep this intermediate result around and, and you think of it sort of like caching. So you can keep this, this intermediate computation that you've done stored somewhere in a special cache, so that way if you have another query that would benefit from accessing it, uh, or even is you know, the exact same query, you can go back and, and rescan uh, your intermediate results so you don't have to go start from scratch again. But, uh, from a from a like correctness point of view, there's no reason to keep keep the uh, intermediate results around as soon as the the query is done executing. Yes. What if your memory system was able to return pages? So the question is, what if your memory system is able to re return sorted pages to you? So you mean like a. Uh, uh, So like a, a hardware acceleration or in-memory computing. Um, th that would be nice. Uh, I guess the, the same problem is that if you, uh, y you're, only, you're only getting um, sorting at the level of the page, right? So you still need to, even if you can sort in the hardware, I guess it doesn't have to go through the CPU or whatever, but if you can sort in the hardware or in the memory, um, then you, you still need to do this kind of merge merge phase, right, to get the, the longer runs. So I guess you could accelerate the, the sort part of it, but uh, each individual page would be sorted, but then you still need to merge them together into a longer uh, run. Okay. 
So uh, the, the general external merge sort is kind of this generalization where you have um, some number B of buffer pages rather than just the, the two pages that we're, we're working with. And what we want to do is on every, uh, uh, on each pass, we wanna, we're going to uh, work with these B uh, buffer pages at the same time. So in the first pass, we're going to produce N uh, divided by B ceiling um, sorted runs each of size B. So then on subsequent passes, we're going to merge B minus one runs um, to, to do this K-way merge. So we're gonna take all these uh, pages now, uh, B of them, and we're gonna merge uh, all at the same time into a single run. So in this case, the number of passes that we end up with is given here, uh, and the total IO cost is still again 2N uh, times the number of passes that we have, um, because again, we're reading and writing all of the pages on every single pass. So an example of how this works uh, is pretty straightforward. It's just uh, basically, let's say, we want to determine how many passes it's going to take to sort 108 pages with five buffer pool pages. So our, our inputs are n equals 108 and b equals 5. And you know, kind of we can go through each of the how the passes work. So in the first one, we're going to produce 22 sorted runs of, of five pages each. The last of these is uneven. The last, the last run is only going to be three pages long on pass uh, number one. We're gonna end up with six sorted runs of 20 pages each. And again, because it's uneven, the last run's gonna be eight pages long. Uh, on pass number two, we're gonna end up with two sorted runs. Uh, the first one's gonna have 80 pages and the second one's gonna have 28 pages. And then the last pass, uh, we're gonna have the whole file sorted of 108 pages. So again, we end up with, we can figure out using this uh, uh, formula how many, how many total passes we're going to need. So are there any questions kind of about how, how to generalize the uh, two-way merge sort into this uh, K-way merge sort? Okay, so the next thing um, to, to think about is uh, we've talked about uh, B, B plus trees in the past, and they maintain the data in sorted order. And we also looked at you know how we can kind of scan uh, B plus trees to get a, a sorted result from the the leaf nodes of the B plus tree. So uh, it's natural that you know, rather than doing this this um, uh, sort uh, merge sort thing, uh, if we already have the data stored in some kind of sorted data structure like a B plus tree index then uh, it pr makes perfect sense to, to leverage that in order to uh, accelerate our sorting. So there are two cases that we kind of talked about in the, the B plus tree lecture. Um, they apply the same here. So there's either a clustered B plus tree, which is uh, the data is stored in sorted order in pages based on whatever the, the clustering attribute is. Usually it's like the primary key, um, but it's stored in whatever, uh, um, order, the, the physical tuples are, are stored in pages uh, in, in whatever order the, the uh, whatever the sort order is. The other case is the unclustered B plus tree, which uh, remember can be you know, completely out of order. It just gives us some kind of data structure built on some non-primary uh, sort attribute. So we'll look at the first case first. Uh, we have here a, a, a table that's stored uh, in a clustered B plus tree. And again, we're going to traverse um, to the leftmost leaf page, just like we did in the, the previous version where we wanted to get a scan uh, of the, the uh, tuple pages. And uh, since they're in sorted order, we're going to get nice sequential uh, access here. We're going to be able to access all of the tuples in their exact sorted order. First, we look at page 101, then page 102, et cetera. Uh, because this is already maintained in sorted order and it's, it's um, guaranteed by the B plus tree. So this is always going to be better than, than that external sorting algorithm because there's no computational cost here. We just, we already know it's in sorted order. We can just scan forward um, in, in a sequential scan with sequential disk IO. So the, if, if, you're, if your query optimizer in your DBMS knows this and it knows that uh, you have a cluster B plus tree uh, index on, on the data, then it can kind of choose whether um, it makes sense to, to execute a um, 
some kind of sorting operation, or if it knows it's already in sorted order, it can just uh, return a, a, a scan over the, the uh, sorted root data. So the other case uh, is this unclustered B plus tree, uh, and as you may have guessed, uh, you're going to end up with really bad uh, IO access patterns. It's gonna be random access because basically you have all of these pointers pointing all over the place in your base data, and uh, it's going to, to have completely random I.O. patterns. So in general, um, you're going to end up with one disk I.O. Per, per record in your B plus tree there. Uh, so this is going to be really bad um, because now we're doing, you know, for, for every single record, we're doing a disk I.O. rather than in the uh, sort, sort merge join, we can, uh, or sorry, rather in the sort, uh, merge sort phase, uh, we'll talk about the sort merge join next next class, but in the, the um, merge sort uh, uh, phases, we can constrain how many passes we have to do and we can figure out how much uh, disk I.O. we need to do. So uh, I also mentioned that you can use sorting to, uh, as, a, as a precursor step to implementing an aggregation. Basically, the way it's going to work is we're going to collapse values for a single uh, attribute from, from multiple tuples into a single scalar value. So that's what the aggregation does. It takes these uh, groups of attributes grouped by some uh, key that you want to group by, and then it, it uh, compacts them into a single scalar value. Think like uh, max, min, average, sum, that kind of stuff. So again, I, I, I sort of mentioned um, earlier there are two different choices that we have, sorting or hashing. Uh, first, we're gonna talk about sorting, um, but uh, I'll give you a, a small spoiler. Uh, hashing is going to be uh, better in, in a lot of cases. So there are some instances where sorting might be preferred, but, but uh, hashing is going to be better in a lot of cases. But we'll start uh, first with talking about sorting um, because uh, it's, it's a little bit easier to, to think about. We've kind of talked about the, the um, uh, prerequisite algorithms that you need to get there. So uh, just as a simple example, let's, let's take distinct. So uh, imagine that we just want to get all of the distinct uh, course IDs from, from this enrollment table where uh, some student got either a B or C in the course. So uh, we just want only, only the, the course IDs where some student got one of those grades and we want to order it, let's say, by uh, course ID. So it has this sort property. Uh, it would be beneficial here for us to sort them so we can, we can give the um, uh, results uh, back in sorted order. So the first step that we're going to do, uh, and this, this will come up again in our uh, discussion of query optimization and query planning, but the, the first thing you pretty much almost always want to do is remove useless data uh, as, as early as you can in the plan. So we have this table here. Uh, th there is uh, one, one tuple in there where the, the student got a grade of A in the course, so we wanna filter that out as early as we can in the plan so we don't have to you know, uh, work on that in our subsequent operators. We don't have to include it in our sort because it's not gonna be in our results set, so it's just wasting our time um, trying to sort something that we don't, we don't care about. So we want to filter things out as early as possible. So we apply this selection predicate where grade in uh, B or C. Then we want to remove the columns we're not going to need. So the only uh, column we have in our uh, uh, select clause is select distinct CID. So we only are going to need the CID column uh, in our results set. So again, kind of going along with this idea of removing as much uh, unnecessary data as possible. We want to apply our projection here to get rid of the other two columns that we don't need. So now we're left with just the CIDs. And then the final, the final step um, in the sorting aggregation is obviously to sort. So we're going to take the CIDs that we have uh, after the first two steps, and we're going to sort them in uh, this ascending order. And now what we're going to do is just essentially one final scan through the sorted result in order to remove duplicates. So we'll start at the beginning. We see, okay, we see 15,445. As we're scanning forward, we see, okay, there's another. I just saw that 15,445. I don't need this next one, so we'll get rid of it. And you can kind of scan forward in this way, checking if the uh, um, 
current key that you're, you're looking at is the same as the last key you just saw. If it is, you can get rid of it. Otherwise, you kind of add it to your results set. So uh, this is kind of the, the high level idea of how sorting aggregation works. Are there any questions about this? Okay, so um, let's talk about some alternatives to sorting. So what if we don't need uh, the data to be ordered? So in the last example, there was the order by clause at the end that said, okay, we want this result produced in this particular order. Now let's just say we just want the result back, we don't care. So an example is like if we're forming groups in a group by statement and we don't care what, what order they're in, uh, that doesn't require ordering. Or if you're removing duplicates, and you, again, you don't care, there's no order by clause, you don't care what, what order you get the results back in. So an alternative that we can use in these cases is hashing. And it's gonna be a better alternative in these scenarios um, than, than doing the, the full sorting. And it, because it, it can end up being computationally cheaper than having to sort uh, the, the input to the, the later operators in the query plan. So basically the way that we uh, compute a hash uh, or perform a ha hashing aggregation is to build some kind of ephemeral hash table as the DBMS is scanning the table. So for each record, we're gonna check whether uh, there's already an entry in the hash table. If we're doing a distinct um, operation, then you know if we, if we hash the key, go look in the hash table, it already exists, we can just throw it away, we don't need it uh, because we already know it's in the hash table. If we're doing a group by, and for now, let's assume that the, um, the aggregation function is going to be commutative and associative, so something like sum or uh, min, max, that kind of stuff. Um, we can just perform uh, the aggregate computation, so some kind of incremental uh, aggregation. Imagine like a sum, you know, if I want to sum all of the um, uh, values together for a particular key, then I can just go and for each, each, uh, each time I hash the key and find that key in the hash table, I just add the value to the running sum until I get to the end and I have the total sum. Uh, if, if you have other aggregates like median or something, then uh, you have to do something different, but we, we won't talk about those here. So uh, if everything fits in memory, the same with the, the sorting, then this is easy, you're done. Um, I mean, you just use one of the hash tables that we talked about uh, before, you can use your favorite hash table, whatever. Uh, it's all gonna fit in memory, you'll be fine. Um, there won't be a problem. But again, if the DBMS has to spill to disk, then we need to be uh, more careful about how we uh, manage our, our IO and how we manage our operations. So this algorithm is going to be called an external hashing aggregate or aggregation operation. And basically it's, it's split into these two phases. So in phase number one, it's going to be the partition phase. And what we're going to do is divide up the tuples into these different buckets based on their, their hash, uh, the hash of their key. And then while we're doing the partitioning, we're going to write them out to disk uh, when each of our partitions gets full. So once that's all done, that's one pass through, through the uh, data. In the next phase, phase number two, the rehashing phase, we're going to build an in-memory hash table for each partition and compute the aggregation over that partition and then there'll be a final phase where we merge um, our, our uh, intermediate hash tables into one final hash table for the result. So kind of it's the, it's the same high level idea of this divide and conquer approach uh, as the external merge sort. And it's going to help us uh, through our partitioning, it's going to help us maximize the, the sequential IO that we're gonna to perform to and from disk and we'll see why um, in a second. So, Again, phase one, just to, to uh, dive down a little further, the partitioning phase, uh, we're going to use some hash function H1 to split the tuples up into partitions, separate partitions that are gonna be stored on disk. And a partition is just one or more pages that contain the set of uh, all the keys with the same hash value produced by H1. Uh, and then kind of they're, they're spilled to disk in the same way that we were doing the spilling of the uh, output buffers for the, um, the sort where we, uh, you know, as soon as we, as soon as we filled up a buffer uh, for the output, we wrote that out to disk and then we had, we reused the buffer to, to fill up the rest of it. So kind of as soon as the output buffer fills up, we can write it out to disk. So again, assume that we have B buffers here and we're gonna use B minus one buffers for the partitions and then one buffer for the input. 
So the, the kind of the, the key idea is that the same value from, or the same key from different tuples are gonna hash into the same partitions. We'll get all of the, the same keys with the same hash co-located in a partition. Um, and it, it's, it is kind of like the opposite of uh, doing the sorting operation. So in the, the sorting operation, we had uh, one input buffer and then you know, B minus one output buffers. In this, sorry, we have, sorry, I, I reversed that. Uh, in this case, we have one input buffer and B minus one output buffers. In the other case, the K-way uh, sort, we have uh, B minus one input buffers and one uh, output buffer. So we can see an example of kind of how this phase number one works. Uh, again, we have the same query here, except I removed the order by, so we're just getting all the distinct CIDs that meet this case, same table. And again, we're gonna do the same thing. Um, we're, we're going to, to filter as early as possible to remove the rows that I don't need. Uh, and then we're going to remove the columns we don't need. And then when we get to this partition part at the end, remember this is, this is where we're gonna do the sort, but instead here we're going to do the partitioning. So we're going to pass the keys through this H1 uh, function and it's going to uh, route us to these B minus one partitions. So in this case, we can see all the, the 1545 keys end up in the, the first uh, uh, page there. And then they, uh, I think that the, the first two pages are part of the same partition. So all of those keys end up in, in those partition, uh, that partition there. And then the bottom page is a separate partition, so that fills up separately. So we kind of uh, pass it through this H1 um, hash function and it splits them up into these different partitions. So again, kind of this one is filled up, so we have the, the overflow values in there. So now in this phase number two rehashing phase, for each of those partitions that we created on disk, um, we're going to read it into memory and build an in-memory hash table based on some second hash function, H2. So this is just uh, se separate from the original H1 hash function that's gonna give us a, low, uh, uh, a hash offset into our um, in-memory hash table that we're building. And we're gonna go through each bucket of the hash table uh, to bring together matching tuples. So imagine, uh, just for now, for simplicity, that our, our hash table is going to fit in memory. Um, you can have the same kind of uh, buffering idea that we had with our, uh, our you know, external uh, or extendable hash table that where you can you know, build it up incrementally and spill pages to disk. But for now, just assume it's a really simple uh, linear probing hash table. So like I said, we're assuming that the, the hash result is going to fit in memory, but uh, it, in the general case, doesn't have to. So now the second phase, rehash. Again, we have the same setup here. We have these uh, partitions. So these are the, the partitions or buckets that are produced by phase number one. We have the first buckets there. And then um, we, we want to do a scan through these, uh, uh, each of these buckets and, and build this in-memory hash table. So we're gonna pass them through H2. As we iterate over each uh, page stored in these buckets, we're gonna pass them through the H2 hash function to populate this in-memory hash table and we're gonna build up the values and put them in there. Remember again, we're just looking for the distinct CID values. So if we hash in and we find a duplicate key in this in-memory hash table, then we just throw it away because we don't need, we don't need duplicate. We just want all of the unique keys uh, in the hash table. So kind of we, we build up this uh, in-memory hash table from this first partition here. And then when we're done with it, uh, we can immediately add them to our final result. And we can do this because we know that there's, uh, it's not possible for any of the keys that are in any of the other uh, phase one buckets or partitions to, to show up again. So we're not, we, we never have to backtrack and look at previous partitions because all of the partitions are disjoint. We have, we have completely disjoint partitions that we produced in phase number one. So as soon as you know, we're done looking at the pages uh, in this first partition, we can write out this hash table to our result set. We're done with it. Uh, those keys are never going to come up again in later partitions. So we can go down here to one of these later partitions and we see, okay, we're gonna run it through hash two uh, and build up uh, our new hash table. We can get rid of the, the previous one. We've already written it out to our final result. Uh, and then when we're done here, looking at, at the pages in later partitions, we can just add that to our, our final result. So um, are there any questions about how this, this uh, 
two-phase partitioned hashing works. Okay, so just to reiterate, the first phase is the partitioning phase where you kind of build up these disjoint partitions. The second phase is the rehashing phase where you build this final hash table at the end uh, for each partition. So what have we achieved here in doing this? Well, we've taken you know, the, the giant hash table that we would have had to build otherwise over all of, all of the keys. Instead, we've broken it down into these smaller disjoint hash tables, which has taken the random IO from the giant hash table that we would have had to build and, and given us now sequential IO, since the partitions can each be read in sequentially and we can write out the final results sequentially. So we've avoided this kind of big giant random IO hash table and we've turned it into smaller sequential IO uh, operations. So that's, that's the, the key idea behind uh, splitting it up into this partition and rehash uh, phases. Okay, so uh, if you, that, that was um, uh, getting the distinct keys. In this case, uh, if, if you want to do some kind of aggregation uh, called ha hash summarization, basically um, during the rehash phase, we're going to want to store uh, uh, output values of the form, the group by key, whatever key we're grouping by, and then the running, running aggregate that we're computing. So when we want to insert a new tuple into the hash table, we first go to see if there's a matching group by key. If there is, that's great. We just take whatever the value is. Let's say it's the current running sum. We add whatever our, uh, our value is to it, and then uh, we're done. Otherwise, if the group by key doesn't exist, then we need to insert the group by key and then um, our, our starting running value. So kind of uh, just as an example of how this would look, let's say now we want to get the um, uh, average GPA grouped by course. So kind of the, the process is similar. We're going to do the phase one partitioning into to disjoint buckets, and then we're going to run them each through uh, their, their individual, um, uh, building up their individual hash functions, hash tables, and then uh, merge all these results into the final hash table. So we get kind of this uh, uh, key value output where the key is the, the group by key, so in this case course ID, in the value, uh, in order to get the average, we need to keep track of the count and the sum. So it's the count of the number of values that, that um, match the key, and then the sum of those values. So you, you can think about this kind of, you know, the different running totals, most of them are easy. Um, the, the minimum value is just the minimum one you've seen so far, max is the, the maximum you've seen so far, sum is just adding them all up. Uh, and count is obviously just count, but for the average, we're going to keep around both the count up front and the sum so we can compute it in this kind of online fashion. So then um, once we have this, we're going to take those, those uh, running values and convert them into our final result just by uh, dividing the, the, the sum that we've computed by the count, and that gives us the average. So are there any questions about kind of how this process works? No, okay. So uh, just kind of wrapping up, um, there's kind of this, this trade-off that we have between uh, sorting algorithms versus hashing algorithms. Uh, it's subtle and depends kind of on a few different things. Like I said, the data layout, if you have a, a row store, an array store versus a, a column store. Um, it depends on the workload that you're running and it depends on the, the data distribution. For example, you know, if you have data uh, sitting around on, on disk, there are different decisions you might make. If you know that your data is already sorted or mostly sorted, then that may make you choose uh, the sorting algorithm over a uh, hashing algorithm, uh, but different trade-offs like that. So there are different reasons why you might prefer one or the other uh, in, in each case. And that's going to be the job of the query optimizer that we're going to talk about later, later uh, in the semester about um, making those sorts of decisions and trade-offs. Uh, to execute queries. And again, kind of we've, we've already discussed the optimizations for sorting, so kind of the, the chunking or, or the buffered I.O. Uh, into uh, large blocks to amortize the, the costs. Uh, and this double buffering idea where you're doing prefetching 
um, to, to keep your CPU utilized uh, while you have disk I.O. going on in the background, so you're not stalled on disk I.O. So kind of, we've talked about all the optimizations for, for sorting, and we've started talking a little bit about uh, some of the optimizations for ha hashing, but in the next class, uh, we're specifically going to be talking about join operators, and that's where some of the more um, advanced optimizations for the, the hashing-based approaches will come up. So uh, that's it for today, and I will see you next time. Yeah. It's the E to I C K. Talking about the St. Ives Brew. Run through a can or two. Share with my crew is magnificent. Plus is mellow. And for the rest of the commercial, I pass the mic on to my no fellow. for a mic check. Plus it. The fuse all set. Then grab a 40. The flim New York and snap his neck. St. Ives. Take a sip. Then wipe your lips. Cue my 40's getting warm. I'm out. He got the dip. Drink it, drink it, drink it. Then I burp. After I slurp. Ice cube. I put in much work. With the BMT and the E-Trouble. Get us a St. Ives Brew on the double.